to the gastroenteritis blues i'm dan valpone i'm here with emily cannell uh no steve this week because he's doing something it's impossible to say um but we're back after another bad sixers week um and a good phillies week so uh i'd argue that matters more even though we're a sixers podcast uh emily where are you feeling uh where are you at about all of the uh Sixers badness and Philly's goodness that has happened this week um well the way that you open the pod it really like leans into our name like with the blues you're just like hello everybody <laughs> oh yeah I mean it's just you know usually it's more exciting to talk about the Sixers but it's this sad. actually seems like hell because the Sixers suck yeah they're kind of painful to watch um and it's just really hard to watch them when there's a lot of other exciting things going on in the city um I know this is a Sixers podcast but you can't help but get like swept We're, into this yeah. Philly situation that's happening right now. So I'm not even going to pretend like I haven't been. We're we're not just a Sixers podcast. We're also an honest podcast. And yes. honestly, the Sixers have sucked. That's and the honest truth. To watch and are not yeah. fun. And I value joy in my life more than that. So yes. So luckily, I only caught two of the games this week. So I feel hopefully lucky. Hopefully one of them was the game. Like one of them, we can cover them all at some point because I yeah. don't know that I watched them all either. So I, the only game, I missed the Spurs game, which was the first game this week. And Is I missed the, the Phillies were on? No, I missed it because I was at uh, dinner with Andrea to celebrate our six-year anniversary of dating. Oh, my gosh. Um, so we went to, uh, oh, what's it called? Uh Seppi and Sons, I think. Oh, Some nice. Yeah. It was very good. I recommend uh, if anyone is listening and lives near Center City. Um, so I did that, missed the game. Uh, they somehow lost to the Spurs, who were p- paying their starting lineup like $22 million combined. So that's impressive. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that game? Because I did not and also felt no need to rewatch it because, like I said, the Sixers have been hit. Yeah, not like terribly any thoughts. Um, I think I watched some highlights of it. I don't think I watched most of it either. I think it was really weird that Brett Brown's like video got booze. Did you hear that? I think that's yeah, weird. but you know what? There's always been those weirdos that hated Brett. They blamed him for every little thing. And like Brett was fine, and Brett was also like just such a I feel like such a such a lovable guy here. Yeah, so um, I think the boos are very strange. Yeah, I mean, I don't disagree, but I don't think it's surprising. I think it's strange, but I think there's a lot of strange Sixers fans out there. That's um, fair. People will probably say that about us, though. So it is what it is. Yeah, um, but yeah, I don't. That I mean, it was after that game. I think that the news was like, oh, by the way, Joel had plantar fasciitis all summer and hasn't worked out in two months, and it's like, oh, yeah. well, we can tell. Yes. When you yeah. lose to the Spurs, you can tell. Like. Yeah, and. You know, we'll get to Joe on a little. I, I want to get into some of these player-specific stuff after we just wrap up the games of the week. The one game that they did win um, fairly easily was the Pacers game. It was the middle game this week. Um, and, you know, Drew is at that game. So I want to I wanna bring Drew in here first and just kind of get your thoughts. I mean, it was, I thought, Um, And Emily, you weren't, I want to hear from you after Drew, because I said last pod, and Emily, you weren't on, but we were both at the home opener, Mm -hmm. and I thought it was just dead in there. Um, And so I don't know how many games you're at this week, Emily, but I know, Drew, you're at the Pacers game. I want to get your thoughts on the game and also just like kind of the the vibe around not just the team, but the city around the team. It feels a little dead and probably deservedly so. Yeah, definitely entering the stadium and stuff, it felt like dead the stadium wasn't even filled which was kind of like a weird sight um in person um the offense looked like they just understood what like they were doing a little bit more than they had the first few games and i think that that's the sole reason they won they got matched up with a bad team in the pacers who shot the ball really poorly um 
So I think we caught them on a bad night too. But our defensive struggles that we've been talking about like for so long, and that was a point of emphasis, is still um, prevalent. And I still don't think it's going to be going away, uh, especially in the Raptors game. It didn't. So, Emily, what do you got? Yeah, so the only game I've been to is the home opener. I sold my tickets for both the Spurs game and the Pacers game. Now that I live in the Burbs, it's just like a lot against the city. Um, I will say that my Pacers ticket sold for $10 a piece, if that tells you anything. Um, I had to lower them multiple times to get them to sell. They sold at like 5.30 on Monday. Um, I think that's like a pretty clear indication that people like are not dying to see this team are not excited about this team like don't really want to spend their money to get into the stadium um so yeah I thought that I mean I'm glad they won a freaking game that's great but it's not against a good team don't think it was a particularly impressive win they didn't blow them out of the building they didn't do much I mean besides like play my comp and I, I don't think it's just the, the you know, it's not just the win-loss record, right? Like, yeah, one and four is disastrous. But, like, it's not – there are – there have been times where the Sixers have been really bad. And, yeah, maybe they're not selling out. But, like, there's energy in the stadium. Like, if it's a close game, like, the crowd is there. And it just feels like this team's playing with no heart right now. And it's like – and I felt that way going back into the playoffs last season – and it's like, how do the fans, how can you expect the fans to get behind you when you don't even seem like you're really that into the game? Like, you're you're hurting yourself because that home court advantage the Sixers used to enjoy is really not there. And it's not like they're getting booed off the court or anything. Uh, at least they're not getting booed off the court in every game. But it just kind of feels like they're not doing their part to like play with excitement and, and create, you know, an atmosphere where, you know, a few buckets can turn into a run because you get the crowd behind you, that kind of thing you get at home or where you get the home calls because, you know, the fans are working the refs and the fans are loud and it, it just feels like they're missing that. And then they go to Toronto and I just, they look horrible, and there's – offensively, it's standing around, standing around, standing around. Um, they I, – I mean, every play is like come down the court, set like one ball screen for Harden, Harden passes, gets the ball back. No one cuts anywhere. Everyone's standing around off ball. Maybe get one more ball screen, and then someone gets up a heave as the shot clock expires. That feels like every play. There's so few easy buckets. And even like Maxi had his best game of the year against the Raptors. And it still felt like effort wasn't there from him in a way that we're used to it always being there from him. We saw more turnover problems, guys not getting back on defense, including Maxi, the guy who was the fastest guy on the court and had always been there. Joel not contesting shots. Um, and screens are, are being switched incorrectly it's just mistake after mistake and and it, they're not the kind of mistakes where you try to do too much and you drive into the lane and, and you pick up a charge or something they're not high effort mistakes they're low effort mistakes they're not paying attention mistakes guys guys falling asleep on defense and getting blown by like it the, in, the inbound pass is being intercepted like that i right. feel like that's happened like five times already this season it it can't happen like and part of that is probably you know, is probably the coach where he seems not that not that Doc Rivers should have to be telling these players to not throw the imbalance pass away and not that the players should need any extra motivation to play with some heart here. I mean, that their professionals are getting paid unbelievable amounts of money. They should be able to show up to work with, you know, some energy. But I mean, the reality is the players are here. You can't fire the players. And there is talent on this team. I, I think we can talk a little bit about roster construction later because I don't think it's flawless like people have thought going into the season. But for the most part, I mean, 
if if guys are this checked out on on a coach, I'm not saying it's even the coach's fault that they're. I mean, the, the player not that Doc doesn't deserve blame for a lot of things, but I mean, the players should be able to bring the energy on their own. But the fact they're not, I I see it as maybe it's time to get a new voice. Like the Phillies, you know, they brought in Rob Thompson, and you. I don't know, something just hit my window. I don't know what it was. Um, you know, the Phillies bring in a new manager, and sometimes just the fresh voices. I mean, because in baseball, like, how much is the manager even really doing, right? Like, it's not like a heavy X's and O's sport as much as basketball is, where there's moving pieces constantly. It's like, I mean, there's matchup decisions to be made. But I mean, for the most part, you know, sometimes a fresh voice can just kind of get a clean slate and get guys re-energized. And I mean, we can have this conversation a little bit more later, but, uh, you know, your thoughts on Toronto, Emily, and, you know, is there... Uh, where where are you at with with what the Sixers need to do to turn this around at this point? Yeah, I just find like the offense, not even to talk about like their defensive issues, which are just bad, but like the offense is so stagnant all the time. It drove me crazy watching them last week, even like in the home opener. You know, I they kind of got it going when they played like their small ball bench lineup, and that's when the crowd really got into it not to like rehash things from last week, but then when they bring in Joel and Harden, they just turn into this like very weird two man game where they don't pass to anybody else. And then no one else cuts. And it happened last night. I don't know how I looked up at least three times last night and Joel is being double teamed and no one's cutting and Tobias and PJ Tucker are both standing in the same corner and no one's moving. And I'm just like, how is this an efficient way to score the basketball? Like it doesn't make any sense to me. And if there's not a leader in the clubhouse, whether it be, and I mean, it could be a player, but clearly it's not because they keep doing it. Then it needs to be the coach that needs to like say like, what the hell are you doing? Like move, but they don't seem to be responding to anything he's saying, in which case I feel like maybe it's time to get a different voice in there. It doesn't, someone needs to get a fire because the things that they're doing are not working the offense isn't working and their record shows it, you know, the way we're kind of feeling about them shows it. It's not fun to watch. It's not fun basketball. Yeah. I I think, you know, if, and we talked about this last week and I was pretty harsh about it and I meant it and I stand by it where, you know, if you were to pick out besides ball handling, basically a weakness in Joel's game, it's that mentally he seems lost sometimes he seems to check out and he seems to mope and and when your best players do that it does translate to the rest of the team and he's just he has shown throughout his career he is not the guy that's going to step up and be a vocal leader and and be the be the mental leader of the team get the team back on track mentally right that's not him and, and that's I wish fine it, it doesn't have i to wish be it were him, him but someone has to do it right well and you know i wish it were him you know i think he would be a better player if it were him, if he were, if he were able to be a, more of a leader with the team's mentality and really better able to, you know, handle his own on the court sometimes. But yeah, that's the reality of who he is. He is our star. We work around him, right? We work around his strengths and we work around his weaknesses. And at this point, I think you have to start thinking about, about that next step. So uh, let's go to an ad. And uh, when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about a little bit more about Doc Rivers because uh, there's more to be said there. So here's your ad. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed that ad. Who knows what it was about? I guess we'll find out later. Um, so we're back from the ad. And we were just in the middle of fetching about Doc Rivers because he has not led this team to a strong start this year. And I think when we talk about how much leeway he has, I'm really not sure. I'm not sure what his leash is this season, but I would hope it's pretty short. And we've seen, you know, um, We've seen the Rockets make changes early in the season, bringing in Mike D'Antoni when, you know, the Kevin McHale Rockets were struggling. Um, And the Sixers are off to such a bad start. And I know that Daryl really respects Doc. And ideally, 
you know, if they thought he could be on the hot seat, they wouldn't go into a into a must win season basically with him as the coach if they didn't really believe in him. But I think we're at the point now where it's starting to feel like the earlier the better. Like he's losing command of the team and to bring a fresh voice in, to bring fresh schemes in and give the team time to really work on them and thrive in them until the season starts, or I'm sorry, until the postseason starts. Knock them would they get there at all because they are on pace for like 17 wins or something. But, um, you know, I, I think that you can't bail too early here. I mean, what do you think, Emily? Yeah, I agree. I, you know, I just think even like, I don't know if like Doc seems in, even into it. Like, it's just a very like ho hum of everything. Like, no one is fired up. Like, no one cares what was his like comments after the Spurs game or like we're not ready to win yet like what were you doing all season like how are you like are you as the coach saying that like that's your job like you're basically sitting there saying like I don't do my job like yeah. your job is to get them ready to win and you just got up in front of the media and said like I'm not doing my job so like if you're not doing your job then leave like I don't understand and like I'm wondering like where's the panic with this team not that not that as a fan we're panicked, and I think, you know, it's great that the Eagles have been great and the Phillies are in the World Series, right? And, like, all of that kind of allows you to tune down. I mean, I'm still watching most of the games in part because there's nothing on and in part because we have to do this podcast and we have to talk about the games. But, like, who could blame fans for tuning down the Sixers right now? As you should. Great call. Um, and I think – that's fine from a fan perspective. We can look at it and say one and four, hopefully they get it together. They can still make the playoffs. Obviously they're, if it's been five games, like it'll be all right. Um, but within the team, like where's the panic that like, we have a whole season ahead of us and we have all this talent on the team and it's not working. Why isn't it working? Challenge each other, right? Like why isn't the effort there? Why isn't the offense working? Why is defensive communication a disaster? Why is Doc saying every game we need to get back on defense and no one's back on defense, right? Like, and Doc doesn't seem to be the guy right now that's going to stand up and get yelling. And Joel and James are not that, but someone's going to have to be with this team. And I think they need another voice to, to really challenge them. And, and obviously I'm not, <laughs> not advocating to hire this, this person, but as an example of when we've seen something like this work, not that it was a coaching change, but the Celtics midway through last year were really challenged by Ime Udoka to, to play up to their potential defensively and to share the ball offensively and to have it not be Jalen and Jason isolations. Now, like I said, not really looking for the Sixers to bring in Ime Udoka, um, of course, but, but to bring in someone who will challenge the stars, who will, you know, who will challenge them to play the right way instead of just kind of letting this happen and watching this happen and, seeing as it happens that there is no panic that there's no that oh like this whole like oh we're not ready we'll be fine like whatever like no like like it has to be an everyday thing it can't be like oh we had a bad game we didn't bring the effort it has like then that leaks into the playoffs you have to build the habits of every day we play like this and the Sixers are not playing like that ever and and they used to play like that usually and not every day and you saw it get worse and worse towards the end of last season as as you get into to march and they're just playing lazy and they they obviously make the playoffs but they get in the playoffs and and you know they go up 3-0 on toronto and then they get lazy for two games again and and you draw out the series and you the more you draw out the series the higher chance joel gets hurt what do you know joel gets hurt in game six right like these things happen and it's not always, there's not always the next game because you play lazy in game five and game six against the Heat and boom, your 2-2 comeback is blown. You lost, right? Like, and it gets more frequent and more frequent because it's easier to play with those bad habits. And that's what the Sixers are at right now is that they're, they're, a, they're a team that is not fun to watch, that is not playing hard compared to other teams. And they don't deserve to, to be anything better than one and four. They don't. This, this is the record they have earned. It's the record they deserve. And it's how good they are right now. They are a one in four team right now. Yeah, they have talent, but this is where they're at. Um, I want to know what your thoughts are on who you would like to see. I think we're both in a, obviously we can't, we're not taking for granted that this is going to happen because it, I mean, probably won't based on what 
you know, we're seeing right now. But if if we're agreeing that we would like to see the Sixers move on from Doc, or do any names come to mind that you're interested in? Um, I don't really have any names. Um, like I'm of two minds. One, I think like you have um, like a Sam Cassell sitting on your bench. And I think that's like a person that a lot of people would be interested in. You know, you kind of see him. There's been plenty of videos of players working with him off, you know, in the off season, the Harden Maxi video comes to mind. Um, and, you know, he's not afraid to like, get in there like just get in there and like mix it up with players like have you ever seen like doc rivers do a drill with a player like no it doesn't happen um well doc doc's not moving great to be fair to doc fair i mean but you know like i maybe they need that kind of person that like gets out there and does something with them and you know challenges them yeah um so that's an option i don't know if that's like the best option because like maybe we just need like completely new blood in which case i kind of think that like some, not even a coach that like I know of, like some young coach that is kind of close to like, you know, the same vein as like an Ime Joka, a young play, like a young guy that relates to these guys more and isn't like challenges them. When he challenges them, it's not like your grandpa challenging you, but it's like your guy that you, you know, play pickup with on the weekend challenging you to like be better and do better. And I think that maybe these players will respond to that more because like, the older coach doesn't seem to be working for them. Yeah, I kind of lean towards that latter, I guess, characterization of a potential coach uh, as well. Um, internally, I the one guy that interests me internally a little bit is Dan Burke, which is a guy that no one is really talking about. And that's fine. I don't think it would be him. But he took over when Doc was, I think, sick. Um, mm -hmm. And... I think he's like a, a bit more fiery of a guy. And, you know, we, <laughs> we heard him back when he was in, in Indiana, like kind of calling out Joel and, and whatever, like, I don't really, whatever. It was annoying at the time, but like, I think you might need a guy with that energy. Who's just like, you know, brings a little intensity, brings a little like anger and like F you mentality out there. The Sixers are fully lacking it. And I think when you look at the, the best Sixers team they've had, or the closest they've gotten to moving on, it was they were playing with Ben, with JJ, with Jimmy Butler, with Tobias Harris, and with Joel Embiid. That was their starting lineup. And you look at that starting lineup, and you say, Ben Simmons, ass. He's an ass. J.J. Redick is an ass. He, pl he plays like an ass out there. Like he's, he's an asshole on the court. Like The Sixers need guys who are going to be assholes. That's what I want. Like Jimmy mm -hmm. Butler, asshole. Joel, at the time, he's not playing like that anymore. But he used to you know, go dunk on you and post it on Instagram. And I'm fine that he's not doing that anymore and that maturity. But I want him to bring back that same, like, I want to dunk. He needs to have that ground. energy for, like, those 48 minutes. And then yeah. he can, like, well, be a dad and, like, chill out. That's fine. I want him to be an asshole again. I want him to want to embarrass the the opponent, right? Like, Tobias yeah. was a nice guy, whatever. He was stunk that series anyway. He's but, always like, going to be nice. I, I want that. I want that back. And it's just frustrating. And I think they may, like, maybe Joel can get that back. Maybe Harding can be that. I think Tucker could probably be that, right? But, like, they're missing that. They're missing that, like, edge. They don't have it. And, you know, I think the, the outside hire people mention is Dan Tony. I'm not sure that he really brings that as much. Um, I, I, I agree with you. Like, there might be – there fully well could be someone who's very respected around the league that we don't know too well that could definitely bring something like that. Um, and we'll have to see, but um, – and really, I mean, Ben lost that too, but Ben is just saying in that season, he had it, right? Like yeah. even he struggled in that series, but but he had that mentality and and they they miss it. They do. And and they're not as fun because they're missing it. And even as flawed as that team was where they couldn't, you know, they really couldn't get it together and they were imperfectly built. Um, they still were defensively so much better, so much better because they they played with, with passion like like it would be like personal if, the, if they got scored on and it would be like i want to embarrass you on offense and there's none of that they're they're fully missing it 
Um, like so, and so pressure. many like offensive rebounds they miss. They just like don't care. They shoot the ball and then they get back because they're like, oh, it, it either went in or it didn't. But like, if it didn't, it's not, I'm not going to worry about it. Like you need to like get offensive rebounds and like get, how many times do we like get outscored on second chance shots? Like, so like it's, that stuff yeah. matters. I, I agree. Uh, last thing I want to talk about before we talk about the pills a little is the construction of this team. And I still think this team could win. I say very well could, but you look at how this team is built and how the team has been built really since Daryl got here. And I feel like we're just cycling through strengths and weaknesses of the role players. And it, it feels like Daryl and a lot of the fans think about role players differently and it's not working and it's not how the rest of the league seems to think about role players anyway. I mean, what do you hear? Yeah. After the Horford year, they bring Daryl in. Right. And it's like, we need shooters trade for Danny green and Seth Curry. Now those were like, those trades weren't bad. I'm not trying to like say that those were bad moves or anything, but like now we're lacking in other ways, right. We're lacking um, like real toughness basically. And, you know, we see that as they flame out against the Hawks and, you know, they bring in hard in the next year, midway through the year. And again, it's just like this team is getting out rebounded. They're getting, you know, Harden looks slow and that's another issue, but, but really, I mean, the, the offensive rebounds, they let up kill them and, and, you know, they, they don't have, you know, guys ready to step up on defense so much. Um, uh, and, you know, so now shooters isn't the problem. We have our shooters. So now it's, you know, especially with Ben gone, you know, now, so now it's not, we need shooters. We need, we need the dogs, right? It's all, everyone said all off season. So they bring in Tucker and they bring in house and who is, has just not been very good, by the way, hopefully that changes. Um, and they eventually bring in Montrez Harrell, who is horrible, um, but like, is like a quote unquote tough guy, which I said after they signed him was like, how tough does he really play? Like he's like a small ball big who is and like, it's not focused. that great if you're tough, if you don't really deserve to have that many minutes. So they're well, only, and that's the only thing. beneficial it's, if you're on the court. Well, I mean, he, maybe he's a tough guy, but I'm not, I wouldn't call him a tough player. He's a small, bad defensive center. Like that's not like what you, that's not what we mean by that. Right. And so they bring in all these guys who are like, quote unquote, the dogs. And now like, Again, like we're playing with no energy. We're slow. The team is slow because they brought in old, like Tucker's 37. He's your, and they brought in Melton. Melton's a good defender. That was like a big pickup, but like he's coming off the bench. Tucker's getting all these minutes with the starters and you're starting besides Maxi, you have Harden, Tobias, Tucker, and B. This is a slow team. They're slow. It's not just effort. It's partly effort, but they're not getting back on defense because they're slow. And the offense is slow because the players are slow. Mm -hmm. And so what's the next thing? Are we going to go to summer? We, oh, we need fast guys. And then we'll be too small. And then we need, and it's just, we're going through this. And the good teams, they don't get these band-aids. They build these organizations where they have good players coming through. And I know the Sixers were in a tough spot. And I know that Daryl inherited, inherited a tough situation with the Horford and Tobias contracts. And I get it. But you, you just don't get a pass when, I mean, he's had years and we've built a team that is just cycling through weaknesses because we don't acquire, like we ultimately, we just need good players. We need good role players that don't have, you know, that aren't so like niche, like, Oh, we need the dogs, get all the dogs. Like, no, that's not how good teams are built. And like, maybe the Sixers do turn it around because I think Tucker is good. Like he's not a bad player. Melton. I, I love as a pickup, but like, it's not as simple as like, oh, let's just go guys that fit, get guys that fit this mold. And it's why I think like the tall wing thing that is in, in fashion now with a lot of the league is also going to end up looking silly because Andrew Wiggins isn't just like a tall wing. He's like a, a, an elite. He's not like a good athlete. He's like an elite athlete. He's a, like was a great jumper coming out of college. He's, his shot has improved. His offensive game has improved. He's learned his role with that team. Like he just signed a huge contract. Like, like, we're not just, like, these teams aren't, the teams that win, they don't have Band-Aid guys playing such heavy minutes. And it's so frustrating. That's all we cycle through. There's two or three, depending on how you count Tobias or, I mean, but really, like, they're playing with, like, before this year and, and this year, there's at least one, but, like, one or two guys where it's, like, 
oh, you're just the opposite of a problem from last year and bringing other problems. And it, it's so frustrating to me. I don't know what you think. And maybe I'm, maybe I'm out of line. Maybe this is all they could have done with, with, with how tough their situation is. But it always comes. And listen, like I said, I'm advocating for Doc being fired on this podcast. I'm not advocating for Daryl being fired. I don't. I think it'd be too hard to make a move like that. But I think we should be realistic about what he's accomplished, which is that like he hasn't. I don't think he's been a huge success here by any means. Yeah, I mean, I think his success is going to be measured by whether we win something, and right now it doesn't look like we're going to win anything. Um, yeah, I I kind of agree. I agree with you with this like band aid situation. I never really thought of it like that, but it makes sense. I just don't know. And I mean, I guess this is why I am not a general manager or a president of basketball operations. Like what is the ideal roster construction besides like just copying what other people are doing, but like that doesn't necessarily work for us if it works for them. And I mean, I think, I think a lot of it is luck too. Like these, sometimes people just like draft these. And I mean, I honestly think that we got lucky with Maxi. Yeah, he looked sure. good, but like, you know, you don't normally get that talent in the twenties. Um, and you know, like a guy like Wiggins has like really come in. He's like almost had like a second career. Like, you know, he was a number one pick. It's not yeah. like he was like a scrub from the G league. Well, he was rookie and, of the year. He got a max contract, right? Like, yeah. And then he kind of was like almost out of the league. And then he's like, kind of had this like, or like on like middling terrible teams. And now he's like had this resurgence. Um, and I think that's kind of like, was like lucky but also like maybe it's good coaching maybe it's a good organization maybe it's sure. you know all of those other pieces that we seem to be missing that's like creating a good organizational structure so you can have like these teams that are good for a really long time like the warriors you know yeah no i um i agree um the last thing i want to close with is uh, i want to be very clear that i am criticizing daryl Morey. i'm not asking him to be fired but i think that he gets such a pass and he gets such a pass in the city and everything has always, has always everything bad. That was Doc. Six or sign a guy people don't like. That was Doc. It's like, you know, Daryl's in charge of the signings, right? Like, yeah. And Daryl was Doc's boss. And when I see the conspiracies of like, oh, like Daryl's glad they're starting slow so you can have an excuse to fire Doc. It's like, Daryl is Doc's boss. Like, I understand the money. He fire whenever he wants. Like, I understand the money, like, the politics of it. And the money doesn't come from Daryl. I get that, right? Like, he needs Josh Harris's approval because Josh Harris is going to have to eat the contract, pay another coach. But if Daryl went to Josh Harris and was like, listen, like, we absolutely need to do this. Look at the teams one and four. Like, like where we're at, like, I believe it's a must. And I think that, like, this is the guy we should bring in. Like, I have very little doubt that that gets done. Like, Doc is here. I want to be very clear on what I believe. Doc is still here because Daryl still believes in Doc, right? I've defended Doc at times. I don't think he's a particularly good coach. I just think he gets some unfair criticism. I think he deserves all the criticism right now. Um, but I mean, where I'm at is like, if if you have an issue with with Doc and you think that like Daryl is like excited about what's been happening, like no, he's not because. If he like thought this was going to happen, Doc wouldn't be here. Daryl is the president of basketball operations. So let's just be realistic about what's happening. The Sixers aren't like blowing a few games as an excuse to get rid of Doc, right? Like Daryl isn't like um, some mastermind behind this, knowing they'd start slow, like giggling, like thinking like, ah, now I get my coach. Like that is not what's happening. This is bad. What's happening is not good. And Daryl was not expecting this. He does not want this. And he wants to believe in Doc. That's where we're at. We also know that Daryl, I know for certain that Daryl likes Doc. He, I mean, he might not think he's the coach going forward after what we've seen, and that's fine. Um, I don't think he is, but Daryl, like, definitely runs things by Doc, gets along with Doc, like, likes working with Doc, respects Doc a lot. So that's what's happening with the team. And the team, the six or suck. Let's move on. Let's talk about the Phils. Let's talk about something happier. Um, holy shit, the Phillies are in the World Series. Um, Emily? What do you want to say about it? Um, I'm really excited. I was at game three. It was really, really fun. Um, like my calves hurt for like days from the amount of times that I like jumped up and down. It's just so fun. Um, I think that it's going to be a really hard series. The Astros are really good. Um, as annoying as that is. And it's, I think it'll be, I'm hoping it's a long series. I'm hoping it's like a six or seven game series. 
unless we just blow them out, then it can be a four game series. That'd be fine. But, um, you know, this team just like has it. They, they're kind of doing the exact opposite thing that the Sixers are doing. They play for each other. They get hyped up for each other. Like Bryce Harper wins, you know, the series MVP. And the first thing he says is like, how about Reese Hoskins? Like they're like hyping each other up. They're obsessed with their manager. Um, and they're, you know, it's really fun. There's, there's nothing not to like about this team right now. And it's, the city is very excited and I think it's really cool. Yeah. I mean, you walk around the city, you see Philly's hats everywhere. Um, there's new Bryce Harper murals everywhere. Yeah. I think your point is a good one about how, you know, these guys get excited for each other and it, even when this always felt forced, even when the Sixers like pretended to do all that, like maybe, maybe that was like, you know, the year Mike Scott was in the playoffs and, and actually playing on the team, uh, which was the year they lost to the Raptors. Um, and they had like James Ennis and some of these guys who like, you know, for even for their lack of, you know, NBA level talent for the most part, were like playing hard and like well-liked and, you know, it, even then though, you know, Embiid and, and Simmons were never close. So I think. How much do you put that on Embiid throughout the years? Like obviously with him and Ben, there was the dichotomy of, the relation yeah. but i do like i i do put it. i mean it's the same thing i said where it's like he would be a better player if he were a mentally tougher player on the court on in the locker room like leading uh setting the team's you know mindset i think part of that is you know and you know you know you see james harden he's organizing team dinners and stuff and it's a new team some of the guys have to gel and stuff but but ultimately it's it it's not just like, it's not just him, but he's the constant throughout the years. And I don't put it all on him. I put the, from a leadership perspective, I do put it on him, right? Like Jimmy was the, was the mental leader of that team um, that I, that I mentioned, but from the standpoint of, you know, just having guys supporting other guys on the team, like when MB got, you know, was out for several minutes in that Bucks game, like, and was really struggling yeah he was clapping when the team did something well and they got back in the game and he was cheering them on and stuff but there was no like you know running it like running out on the court when the bucks called timeout like high-fiving guys like cheering like getting hype like giving like you know like big fist pumps like trying to even get himself back in the game and and lift his teammates like that energy is just not there with the team like i think they need a guy who's like i forget um I, I want to say it was when the Phillies fired Ryan Sandberg and brought in Pete McCannon for like the rest of that season. And they ended up, you know, the team still stunk, but they ended up winning like six games in a row. And I could be wrong about when this was, but I think it was at that time when the new manager had a rule that was basically like, we're not sitting in the dugout, like everyone up against the fence, like everyone into the game, cheer on your teammates. And like, they might need a guy to come in and say like, like we're going to act like this until this is just habits until this is how we act. Like, it's not going to be acceptable to like, if you're playing bad, sit at the end of the bench and sulk. Like, Sixers might need that guy. But um, getting back to the Phils for a second, like they've been awesome. And like, I, I, I'm at a point with, with this Phillies team where I really hope they win, obviously, but I'm okay with whatever happens at this point because they've played so well and had so many things go their way. And no matter what happens, no one can take away from this team in this city that the Phillies went to the World Series with a team that no one believed in, that was limping into the playoffs, that was the that was last in everyone's power rankings going into the playoffs. And I believe in them. I think they can do it. But no matter what, I'm like really proud of this team. They've been so fun to watch. They have never given up when they've been down. The Bryce Harper home run was legendary. Uh, Reese has stepped it up. Pitching's been really good. Um, and when guys make mistakes, they get picked up. Like guys are picking them up. And you see it when guys play bad, whether it's, you know, Boom not having a hit in the final game or Sir Anthony not being able to grip the ball and giving up the tying and leading runs because he's throwing all the wild pitches or, um, you know, errors, you know, Segura's error. Like no one harps on them, no one fixates on them. They're not sulking about them. They're going out and playing better later. Or, you know, or if they're, you know, or if the game ends with something they did poorly, but the team wins, like they're celebrating, right? Like it's not, it's more than the individual. And they know that they'll be there to pick up their teammates later. And it's been a lot of fun. And I love how the city is. I, I was out on, 
on broad by by uh city hall after the phillies won on sunday to get into the world series and just to see you know how energized the city was and how excited people were i mean it's 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 like a beautiful thing i mean it's it's something that i have never experienced because i was in pittsburgh during the super bowl run um and i didn't i grew up in the suburbs and it's my first time really getting to feel this in the city i've been in philly for the last two years but Every sport was a bit miserable last year. Even the teams that made the playoffs were a little like, like, I mean, the Eagles got blown out in their only playoff game as everyone expected. And the Sixers, like I said many times on this podcast already, did not bring the energy needed to have the city bring the energy, really. Um, and I think this Phillies team has been different. They've they've brought it. Like, you see them getting fired up for big home runs and running out of the dugout and 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 hyping each other up. And I hope we can bring that to the Sixers, but I'm very appreciative that we're getting it with the Phillies right now. It's um, it's something that we haven't seen from our Phillies in forever. And um, it really is, it's awesome. It's awesome. Um, so World Series coming up, we got, we're recording on Thursday. Um, first game is tomorrow. I'm sure no one will be watching the Sixers game because the Phillies have their Someone will because someone isn't a Phillies fan who's a Sixers fan. But you watch like the first quarter, maybe of the yeah. Sixers. The first pitch is until like eight oh three. Yeah. So Philly. Yeah. All the games start at eight oh three, um, and the Phils. We have a great week coming up. Ignoring the Sixers, even though we will make our picks for the Sixers. Ignoring the Sixers, we have Phils Friday night, Phils Saturday night, Eagles Sunday. Then we have Phils Monday night, Phils Tuesday night, Phils Wednesday night. Those are their home games. Thursday night Eagles, and then Friday, Saturday, if necessary, and obviously the Wednesday, if necessary, for the Phils. Um, just really awesome. You mentioned that you hope the series goes long. I would love it if it could reach six games because I have um, I have a final exam for reproduction on not tomorrow, but next Friday, and mm-hmm. I would love to be able to have that have that over with and then enjoy the Phillies over the weekend but we will see um we'll see what happens uh, it would be really exciting. cool though if we were winning and we won it at home it would be really cool I listen if any way the Phillies win I will not complain if yeah. the Phillies win in four they win in five they win in six they win in seven I will I will have no complaints I will have no Very wish true. it was another way um but it is time to make our Sixers picks to rehash uh, I am Steve and I have picked the Sixers to win every game. Uh, they haven't, they have only won one of them, so we're both one and four. And Drew picked for Emily last week, and he, even though I gave him shit on Twitter, yeah, even though Emily was like fully unappreciative, Emily's currently in the lead because of Drew. So Emily is two and two and three, two and three. uh, because uh, she picked the Sixers to lose to the Raptors, and by she, I mean Drew, because Emily. It's on Twitter saying three and zero, but we didn't let her change it. Nope. So, going into next week, we have Steve's picks, um, and here are the games. So we have the Sixers on Friday. The Sixers are playing in Toronto again at seven thirty. Then it's a back to back. It's a road back to back. So they're in Chicago Saturday night at eight. They're off Sunday. On Monday they're in Washington to play the Wizards at seven. So still on the road off Tuesday and Wednesday, the Wizards come to Philly. So that's a home and home. And that's at six, they play the Wizards. So that's what we're working with next week. Um, Starting with uh, Friday, I want to get Emily's picks, but let's share Steve's picks first. Steve picked the Sixers to lose every game, uh, which would be 0-4. This is his way of punishing the Sixers. Um, I think it's a pretty fair punishment. and hopefully a good sign that the Sixers will actually start winning games. Emily, what do you think? Okay. I am going to say that they go two and two. I'm going to say they beat Toronto, lose to Chicago, lose to Washington at Washington, and beat Washington at home. So win, loss, loss, win. All right. I'm going to say the Sixers go three and one. I think they win in Toronto. I think it's just kind of tough to lose two in a row to a team. The Sixers are that bad. So um, I think they beat the Bulls. Um, 
I think they beat the Wizards in Washington and lose to the Wizards at home. That just seems like a classic Sixers loss. Um, so those are my picks for this week. Um, I think that's all we have uh, for this pod. Just, do you have anything else? Nope, just go Phillies. Drew, anything else? Go Phils. All right, go Phils. There you have it. Um, oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. We have this podcast has has a minute and a half left. Um, so, and I was just reminded of this because I just got a Bleacher Report notification that Brian Windhorst has reported that some scouts believe Ben Simmons isn't aggressive because he doesn't want to get fouled. Um, that's hilarious to me. Um, I'm sure no one else really has anything to say on this, but I just want to say that uh, he continues to be terrible and the Nets continue to be terrible. And that is the only thing keeping me interested in the NBA right now because the Sixers are also terrible, but <laughs> at least Ben looks bad. Um, there it is. That's the pod. Um, please go follow uh, Third and Girl, Steve J. Littman, DA Pelts, There's Team, Gastro Blues Pod. Uh, follow us uh, or subscribe to us on YouTube, uh, Gastro Blues Pod, Sixers Podcast, or something like that. Um, and Drew is routinely putting out very good clips and not just clips, but like edited um, videos of, of the pod and um, and they're good. And if you're not, if you're not subscribed, you're, you're frankly just missing out. So um, get over there, subscribe. It, it is, it is free. So you might as well. Um, that's all we got. Go Phil's. Uh, we will see you next Thursday. Actually, I won't be here because I have a final on Friday, like I said, and I will We're be on a real studying. rotating basis here. One of yeah. So it'll be, strong. it'll be a Steve Emily pod, uh, but they will see you next week. Be safe <laughs> and be great. Bye.